Let's talk about Quinn, an abstract strategy game with hidden pieces, bluffing, and magnets. Welcome to Brains on Games. I'm Dr. Brian McDonald. In this episode, we're going to talk about an abstract strategy game where the pieces are hidden and they're attached to the board with magnets. This is a game called Quinn by Arch and Gravity Publishing. Now, Quinn is a two-player game. It says on the box age eight and up, and maybe the, the arcade version of the rules would apply in that case. I think it's more for older people and, and even the adults I played with had a bit of a tough time wrapping their heads around it, but uh, it is a two-player game, age eight and up, it says on the box, and games take anywhere from 15 to 45 minutes to play. Let's take a deeper look at Quinn by Arch and Gravity Publishing. Quinn is a game, now you can see probably on the camera, first of all, it probably looks like I have giant hands and a tiny head, but uh, you can see on the camera just the black pieces that are attached here. The white pieces are probably out of view, but they're on the other side of the board. The pieces do attach with magnets, like I said, and that's what allows these kind of top heavy pieces to stay on the board. Now the pieces have little symbols on them and that tells you what powers they have and what they can do. The faces are removable though because you do have a little bag with extra faces so that you can clone one piece and surprise your opponent by having one extra piece of a particular type. The main version of Quinn, the tournament style game or the, or the third eye version of the game they call it in the rule book this is a medium game in terms of its strategic complexity. Now there's an arcade version and a version where you take the faces off the pieces and you play with them flat on the board so that everyone can see uh, one another's pieces and then there's nothing hidden anymore. Uh, so those versions are more light, but the main game really uh, is medium in terms of its complexity. What you are trying to do in this game is get this piece the light piece. You want to get that piece into the center of the board. There's a, a little center here that has an iris rotating around it. You want to get this piece into the center of the board or you can win by capturing your opponent's light piece. If you knock his piece off the board then he can't get it to the center and he can't win. The game has a fantastic insert that keeps everything organized and the pieces go uh, in these satin bags. So there's one bag for the black pieces and one for the white pieces. Uh, I kept an extra Ziploc bag for the four little clone pieces and those are a different color. The face you can see is a bit of a different color so you know that's the cloned one. So I keep those within the satin bag but inside a little Ziploc just to make it easier to keep it straight. Um, what you're going to do in this game once each player has decided if they want to be the light or the dark piece, uh, then you choose the starting pieces that you want to put on the board. Not too many complicated rules here except that you're putting them in the first two rows of open spots and you can't start with these pieces which are called artificial light. Now the light piece looks, I don't know if you'll be able to see on the camera, the light piece looks like this. The artificial light piece has little stripes across the middle of it. Um, there's a key on the side of the board to help players keep it straight. The, the symbols themselves, they're, they're not intuitive, let me say. Uh, for In terms of what they mean, um, this is called a peripheral, for example. It's two circles that look sort of like two little planets. Uh, they're not intuitive at all, but you do have a little table that keeps it straight. And there are player guides to help you uh, remember what the player powers are and what pieces can capture which other pieces. Once you've set up your pieces in the first two rows of the board and, and you're setting them up so that you can carry out some strategy. So there's no rule for, oh, the, the light piece must go in a certain space. You don't even have to start with the light piece on the board. Uh, you can win the game without your light piece if what you're trying to do is capture your opponent's light. But of course, you don't know where your opponent's light piece is at the start of the game. So you're organizing these things. The extra pieces go on this zero gravity board, which is also magnetic. If I capture an opponent's piece, it's going to go on here as well. The other thing that you need to do before you start the game is choose what the rulebook calls a totem. And that's a piece, it can be any kind of uh, souvenir or anything that means something to you. You discard your totem in order to resurrect a piece that's been captured. So you can only do that once per game. 
the game conveniently did come with a couple of coasters and in fact that's what we used. We didn't use anything special to discard. We just flipped over a coaster when we wanted to use our, our resurrection ability. So that made it easier because it came in the box and everything's organized that way. The rule book says to determine the starting player you're going to have kind of a race to see who can drink a glass of water first but you can choose your starting player really in any way you want and then all you're doing is alternating moves. So each piece moves a different number of spaces that's indicated on your player guide. It's indicated on this little cheat sheet here on the board, this grid on the board as well. You don't have to move them the maximum number of spaces. And really the pieces, unless they have some special ability, are going to move in a straight line. And there are lines here on the board and rings around the outside. So you could, if I had a piece here, I could move across instead of in and out. But remember, this is the spot that I'm trying to get my light piece onto. It's important to, to recognize that you don't need to move your pieces all the, their full movement because um, some pieces move farther than others and you might want to hide their identity from your opponent because you can bluff in this game. The shadow piece in particular, this is one that I always like to use very sparingly. Move it very slowly across the board. It has an actual movement of seven. So if I can get it into a good position and my opponent thinks, oh, this is a void piece or it's a memory piece or something like that, then all of a sudden I can jump this guy seven spaces and he's gonna take my enemy by surprise. And really that's what you're doing. Once the game starts, you're just alternating pieces. You're moving them in straight lines. You're trying to set up some sort of formation that's either going to allow you to get your light into the center or to capture your opponent's light. To, you're trying to figure out which piece is your opponent's light, so you're really watching carefully how they move. There's a few other special places on the board. This iris space is one where none of the piece's powers can be activated or affect anything in the iris, but it does connect to a few spaces on either side, so you can get across here. Then you've got this horizon line, and there's only certain pieces that can go on the horizon line or can move onto it. That's what these peripheral pieces are for, and then once they're there, other pieces can jump over them. So there's lots of little special powers and rules. In the third eye version of the game, there's a hierarchy in terms of which pieces can capture which. So if I've got a piece here on the board, and I'm trying to capture my opponent's piece, I don't know what that piece is. I'm gonna, they call it flashing when you move on to the same space as an opponent's piece. You reveal the identity of both pieces, and then you look to see, well, is that a piece that can capture? Uh, my opponent's piece, whatever that piece may be. Oh, in this case, it's a peripheral. They're the same. Um, if the attacker wins, then maybe I get to capture that piece. If, uh, if it's the other way around, then they switch places. So there's, a, you might want to do that. You might not want to care about so much about capturing your opponent's piece, especially since if they still have their little totem, they can bring it back and they bring those, they bring their pieces back on my side of the board. So that's a good way to get a piece on the opposite end of the board very quickly. So I might not want to capture those pieces. I might just be trying to tease out uh, which one is light and which one is shadow, etc., etc. So all the pieces have different abilities. There's a piece that can switch places with your other pieces. There's uh, another piece. This void piece is really good because it captures a lot of other pieces and it can use an ability where it can move other voids beside it. So there, there's a void strategy even, they call it in some of the videos I watch, but the void does move very slowly. There's a time piece that looks like a little blindfold and you can discard it to reverse one of your opponent's moves. So there's lots of little tricks that you can do in this game uh, in order to figure out which piece is which on your opponent's side and in order to either capture that light piece or get yours into the middle. I should mention, once you've cleared some spaces here, these white spaces on the outside, you may not be able to tell, but they're white dots instead of gray, these are gateways. So once those are empty, once I've moved my pieces into the middle of the board, I could use my turn instead of moving to start bringing out my other pieces that I have in reserve on that zero G board on the side. So, so again, there's lots of ways that you can uh, strategize in this game in terms of figuring out how you're going to win and as I said all the pieces have these different abilities and your opponent doesn't know what's what unless you let him know really or unless he comes in and, and flashes your piece by moving on to the same space. In the arcade version of the rules and there's a separate player aid for the arcade version the pieces powers are simpler 
and there's no hierarchy of capturing. All the pieces can capture the other pieces. There might be a couple of exceptions there. We primarily played the third I one because I wanted to see the tournament version uh, of the game. So I can't recall all the ins and outs of the arcade version, but the powers are much simpler and the capturing rules are much simpler in that uh, edition of the game. What skills are you practicing though when you play a game like Quinn? Well, this is a game where you really do need to plan ahead. You're, you've got a certain number of pieces and you're budgeting them. You're planning your movements and you're also planning whether or not you want to reveal the identity of a piece to an opponent. You know, I, I could move my shadow seven spaces ahead on the first turn of the game if I wanted to, but that kind of leaves him vulnerable in the middle of the board and it lets my opponent know, oh, that's a shadow piece, so I know what can capture it. Uh, I know what my opponent's trying to do. So that's maybe not the best move to do. I might want to slowly move my pieces forward two pieces at a time until I get a few things in place and, and then I can really start executing a plan. And when you are planning ahead and you're budgeting your pieces, you're even budgeting your gateway spaces here, you want to be careful. Maybe you want to have some open to recruit your own pieces, but you don't want to leave one open so that your opponent can resurrect. Um, you know, if you're planning ahead and you're budgeting and you're really trying to be efficient in terms of uh, accomplishing the steps that will allow you to reach that goal, we are talking about a set of skills called the executive functioning skills. A super, super important set of abilities that are all about working towards a goal. And, and those are exercised in any strategy game. But I, I would say this is one where it really does call for those skills in spades because you have to set up a formation in order to accomplish that goal. And that does take time. It takes patience. And you can't be too impulsive. Spatial skills, of course, are super important in an abstract game like this because you are evaluating the spaces on the board and how far pieces can move and which direction they can move in, uh, how, where you need to be in order to be protected but to be within reach of your, the space that you want to get to on your next turn. So you are using some spatial reasoning or spatial problem solving skills as well. This is a game though unlike many, I think, abstract strategy games, it's one where memory is also important. Usually in these kinds of games, you know, you've got the pieces on the board and you know what's what. In this case, that's not true. You don't know what your opponent's pieces are. From my perspective, they all look the same. They just look like these little balls on sticks. And so I have to remember, well, how far did he move that piece? Did he bring another piece over to put it adjacent? Is that Was that the void piece or was that something else? Did he switch places using a memory piece? These are all things that it's important for me to keep track of if I can. And it's easy to lose track because, as I said, all the pieces look the same and they're all moving around the board. So memory, particularly visual memory, working memory too, are examples of skills that you're practicing when you play this game. Now, visual memory, of course, is memory for, you know, a visual for something that you see. And working memory is being able to adjust and work with that information in memory. It's like the whiteboard where you juggle information when you have to keep track of multiple things, which is what you're doing when you play this game. Final thoughts, though, about Quinn. Well, this is a game, I mean, it's gorgeous. I mean, look at this board. It's fantastic. And you really can't see where they've inserted the magnets. They're identified by those spots. But when I first opened the box, I was surprised there were magnets inside the board. You can't really tell that, that they're there. Um, so it really does lend a certain, you know, table presence to a game where you've got these pieces that stand up but they're well balanced. It made us think, like some of the players that I played with were thinking, wow, if they can make a board like this, imagine the crazy pieces that you could build that could stand up because of the magnets in here. You don't have to worry about balancing those pieces if they're stuck on the board with the magnet. So very, very cool in the way they've designed these pieces and this board. The removable faces and the fact that you can clone one of the pieces, that is an interesting wrinkle as well. Um, so what, uh, what a gorgeous setup you have here. And then you've got the actual strategy. And this is a game where once you've picked up on how the pieces move and interact with one another, there really is a lot of strategy here. This is really complicated and you can try different formations and different ways of setting up your game at the beginning. And, and, you know, there's a number of different strategies you can try. It really 
it's really wide open in terms of what you can do because the pieces are so varied in the game and because of the way that they capture and the fact that you might want to be captured in order to bring a piece back on the opposite side of the board. So there's there's bluffing that you can do here uh, that in some strategy games is a bit harder because all the information is visible to all the players. So it's the, you've got a little bit of hidden movement almost or or hidden options for movement when you're playing the game. So there is, I think, a ton of replayability here. If you like abstract strategy games, abstract piece capturing games, if you want to call it that, you know, like like uh, the Duke is a good example that uh, of one of these kinds of games that I love. Of course, chess. Of course, War Chest is another one. There's an expansion coming soon for that one. So this is a, a great addition to that pantheon, I think, of those abstract games. However, it is really hampered by a weak, poorly organized rule book. You know, I don't know how many people would have the patience to learn this game. I mean, I'm motivated to learn it. They were kind enough to send it my way, and I love ga I love abstract games. I'm not very good at them, but I do really like them. I like hidden movement. I love games with magnets. There's lots of reasons why I'm motivated to learn this game. But you've got those player guides that purport to have most of the important rules on there, there's a, a booklet like this, a great big, you know, small print rule book that where you really have to dig around. There's a table of contents at the beginning, but I found myself digging around the rule book to try and figure out, well, what, there's no clear indicator on here what this horizon does, um, it, it, how the pieces interact with each other, even, you know, what happens if I flash a piece and I'm not able to capture it? Um, the fact that the pieces switch places instead of the stronger piece capturing my piece that tried. I'm used to learning new games and, and usually it does not take so long. It's not so much effort. This was really, this required patience. Um, I think that patience was rewarded in terms of like, this is a game that I really liked and I like putting it out on the board and I'm motivated to show it to people, even if it's just because of the magnetic pieces. Uh, but um, it takes several playthroughs to kind of wrap your head around what it is that you're doing. You've got to watch some videos. Maybe you have to watch those how to play videos more than once. You've got to you've got to read through that rule book when there's a specific question. The player aides do give you some information, but we didn't find it was as much as we needed or exactly what we needed at any given time. So they weren't as helpful as as they 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 were helpful for the powers. They weren't helpful for the spaces on the board. We had to look those things up. Um, so I, I really do think that this is a game that's handicapped by that rule book and by the need to find a video, a how to play video. Don't get me wrong, I like how to play videos. I think those are good things to have. Um, I sometimes will watch the how to play video instead of or before I even read the rules just so that I've got an idea in my mind of what the game is all about. Um, but this one, there's so much going on with this game and the way that the pieces are and, and the little rules, like you can't put artificial light out at the beginning. Like there's a lot to remember and keep track of here. And if you don't have a really good rule book and a player aid that includes, you know, 90% of the information that you need to play the game, uh, you're going to have a tough time here. And as I said, it does take maybe three games in order to get used to it. And I'm, I was lucky that you know, this time around, I had some of the same players coming back again and again to try this one out. That's not usually the case. Usually I'm teaching a new game to someone new who hasn't played it before every single week, um, just because of the nature of doing a channel like this. Uh, so I don't know how often this would hit the table at my house, which is too bad because I think it's cool. Um, so I would say that uh, your patience will be rewarded if you do like abstract games, but boy, if you're intimidated by complicated rules or, or you're going to be put off by a disorganized rule book, um, you know, those are both factors that are working against this one. I, it's a two player game. That's often a downside in, at my place because often I have two people who are coming over to play with me. So it's a little bit harder to get a two player game to the table, but I've been lucky enough to have that happen a few times recently. So that was okay. Um, it really is the complexity here and the fact that the rules are, um, yeah, there's a high barrier to entry and a steep learning curve on this one. So I, I'm going to say, look, overall, this was a game that for, it spoke to something in me um, and it might for you as well. 
you need to be patient. You need to put some effort into figuring this one out. You need to put some effort into teaching it to your friend who's coming over to play or your child if you want to play it with your kids. Um, but I think if you do like this style of game, that it is rewarding once you do that. So I'm going to say thanks so much to the folks at Arch and Gravity for sending Quinn. I have an update for you, which is very strange. This has never happened before, but the minutes after I finished filming my review of Quinn, I did get an email from the creators saying that they recognize that the rules are confusing and that the rule book is poorly organized, so they're creating a new rule book. They're going to address, I mean, my biggest concern about the game is that it's so hard to figure out how to play this thing. That hopefully will be addressed in this updated rule book. The updated, illustrated, better organized rule book is going to go in future copies of Quinn and it's going to be available to anyone who buys their copy prior to the release of the new updated rules. So my hope is that things are going to be much less confusing. They're soliciting some uh, suggestions or questions that, they, that reviewers like me or players want to have answered. And, and so I think this is a great idea. And as I said, it's going to address one of my major gripes. Now, it's still going to be a game that's not necessarily intuitive. I mean, like chess, the pictures on the pieces or the shape of the pieces will not tell you what the pieces do. But if you've got clear rules that are well organized, you should be able to figure this one out after a few plays, I hope. Is it still a medium game? Yes. But if the rules are less frustrating, it's going to be way easier to get this one to the table. So I'm really happy to share this update with you. What that means is, if you have any questions, if there's anything about Quinn that's not clear, if, if there's any suggestions for what you hope will go in this rule book at the end of the day, you can leave them in the comment section below the video, or you can email them to me at brian at brainsongames.ca. Brainsongames.ca is the website. That's where future episodes will go. Previous ones are already up there. Brains on Games is the X handle and the Facebook page and the Instagram feed, so we're all over the place. And if you enjoyed this video and you want to be notified of future ones, you can head on over to YouTube and click that subscribe button. Thanks for joining me, and hopefully I'll see you next time.